Well, my name, as you know, is Jane Crowley. Um, I practice now principally from Cardiff Chambers, which is my hometown uh, and where I did my pupillage and practiced as a junior uh, until I took silk a very long time ago, now in 1998. Um, after that, I had uh, connections with other chambers, initially as a door tenant at one garden court uh, in the temple, as it was, now it's in Lincoln's Inn Fields. Um, and I became a full tenant there for about eight years until probably about three or four years ago when I reverted back to Cardiff and uh, remained a door tenant in, in one garden court. Um, I also have door tenancies scattered around the country in my uh, enthusiasm to draw in work from as many places as I can. So I have experience of chambers in uh, Birmingham as well, St Ives Chambers, where I have been associated for a number of years, and St John's Buildings in Manchester. Now, each of those chambers are, like, like my chambers in Cardiff, mixed common law sets. One Garden Court, as some of you will know, is a specialist family law set, um, and that's my particular specialism. But I do, I do come from mixed fam from from a mixed common law chambers. That's my that's my experience as how chambers work generally, and I have chaired pupillage committees, both at one garden court in London as specialist uh, family chambers, and also in Cardiff, um, and also been on tenancy committees. I was also head of chambers in Cardiff for a few years, so I've got a fairly broad set of experiences about people starting off their careers at the bar, um, what the processes are, and um, I don't know whether I can advise you as to how best to pitch yourselves, but I'll certainly do my best to try and uh, highlight what uh, people look for, um, although I think it's probably fairly obvious in applicants. Um, in terms of my practice, as I say, I, I, I specialise in family law. Um, I sit as a recorder, I sit as a deputy high court judge, and I also sit as a president of the restricted panel of the Mental Health Tribunal for Wales. So that's me. Well, you, my, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm Joseph, I was just coming over to you. So thank you. I, I've just had a text from Tom Jones. He says he's joining. So okay. we can expect him quite soon. Um, now, my name is Joseph Morgan. Uh, I'm a I think second year tenant now. I was called to the bar in 2017, so still relatively quite a baby barrister, as they say. Um, I did a, a common law pupillage at Nine Park Place Chambers, uh, just down the road actually from Jane's Fierce Rivals, um, but both common law sets, both excellent sets in Cardiff. Um, I did my first six months in crime and my second six months in the family. Before that, I studied English for three years, and it was only really, I think, of maybe towards the middle of my GDL. The A, I really understood what a barrister did and at the same time desperately sort of wanted to be one. Uh, so I think everybody here is well ahead of the curve that I was on uh, at my sort of comparative to where I was. Um, but yeah, so middle of the GDL, decided I wanted to be a barrister. I was lucky enough to get a pupillage uh, later that year, did my bar course in Cardiff. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a Welsh, Welsh individual, a Welsh speaker, which I think obviously helps in Wales. Um, and then did my, my pupillage at Nine Park Place and was taken on as a tenant in the following year. Uh, I still currently am a technically a, a mixed practice individual. I, I'm drifting more towards family. I think that's just where the most work is at the moment, but uh, I still do briefs in everything from as, you know, as broad as crime, uh, across the chancery, uh, employment, immigration, uh, and of course, all areas of family law. So that's a little bit about my practice. Um, Clearly not as well developed or as experienced as as, as Jane, uh, but one day maybe I will be. So uh, that that's my practice at the moment, and uh, yeah, I think Tom should be on to to, to give you a, the lowdown. I think here he is now. <laughs> here he is. Hello, Tom. Can you hear us? I all yes. Sorry, I'm late. I literally just finished a hearing actually. <laughs> Um, well, I, we, it's actually a perfect timing um, as Jane and Joe have just finished introducing themselves. Could you possibly um, introduce yourself to to the group and then possibly say what what type of work uh, you have been have just hurriedly come across from? Yes, of course. Um, I should also say it's very nice to see you, Harry. 
Um, for all of those people who don't know, Harry is a former uh, Led Let alum alumni. He was uh, one of the students that took part in uh, the Lord Edmund Davis Legal Education Trust uh, program, which is a which is a social mobility charity which encourages people from disadvantaged backgrounds to get into legal careers. So it's delightful to um, see you, Harry. Um, I have a common law practice at Nine Gough Chambers. Um, uh, my my work is divided fairly evenly between um, civil work, um, family work, court of protection work, and public law work, which also includes some crime. Um, I've just finished a court of protection matter. Uh, where I was representing a local authority in a particularly difficult set of circumstances um, relating to effectively lack of lack of provision. Um, I'll be doing a very similar case with with Joseph Morgan actually um, tomorrow uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, my my work is very varied. Um, I represent a number of different clients, corporate clients, um, in individuals. Um, more, more and more on the civil and court protection side, um, which presents a number of different uh, interesting. Um, legal issues. It's a very busy job. Uh, court of protection uh, work in particular is very last minute and so um, you can often receive last minute instructions on, on particularly um, urgent matters. Um, I've been in practice now for uh, three uh, years at Nine Gough Chambers. Um, uh, I did my, I, I finished my pupillage in, in uh, 2018. So there we go. That's my that's my an overview of my practice. Thank you very much, all. Um, I I think we should start start at the beginning, as it were, um, and I'll I'll pose these pose these two questions to to Joe and then and then to Tom. Why why is why did both of you decide to go for um, a, a common law a mixed uh, pupillage, so to speak? Because I'm aware that there are. So there are some chambers that do offer, as, as, as Jane alluded to, um, specialists, uh, specialist pupillages for, for family sets or criminal sets. Why, why did the two of you decide to go down uh, the mixed practice route to start off with? Or was there any particular reason? Well, I think you've got to be realistic when you're trying to uh, get a pupillage, which is you don't some, some, sometimes you don't have the luxury to choose uh, given how competitive it is. But I think in fairness, I always wanted to do a, a common law pupillage and I was delighted that Nine offered me a, a pupillage. I think the reason being is that, and you only really discover this when you actually start uh, the job, is that you will run into people who are the same call as you that work at dedicated employment or family or criminal chambers. Uh, and they may well be slightly further along the curve in terms of their knowledge, just because that's all they do every day. But to balance that out, you have the full, bre full breadth of, of legal work and you get a full legal education. You get to speak to all different types of practitioners and all their idiosyncrasies and all the different types of, sort of practices. And I think the main benefit of choosing a common law practice is that ultimately you, you can you retain that choice. You can decide uh, which area you want to s sort of move towards it. You know, it's very rare that you'll go to your clerks at the end of your tenancy and say, um, you know, I'm doing this and that's it. But you can certainly start to move and drift towards an area that you feel um, is appropriate. I mean, I've done that with family and I know that um, I've got a contemporary, a very good friend who uh, at Jane's Chambers, who's had you know, a very identical sort of pupillage to me, but he's drifting towards crime. And that's something that he's decided to do. Uh, but that's the luxury that you get for doing a common law um, pupillage. Uh, and I think it's almost, I think it's invaluable. And I would urge anybody to really to, you know, unless you are desperately and you know for sure that you want to do a certain type of law, um, a common law pupillage is, is always the best option just to hedge your bets and think, you know, I, I haven't experienced any of these areas of law and it may be something that you have absolutely no idea uh, that you'd be interested in, but you retain that choice with a common law pupillage. I did a. I, I decided to apply for common law pupillages for largely the same reason as Joe. <clears throat> I um, enjoyed most areas of the law in university and on the BPTC, and I wanted to do a pupillage that would allow me to see what these various different areas of the law were like in practice before um, plumping for one. Um, so I, I set out to apply for sets of chambers where I was able to get a common law pupillage. Um, the trouble is there aren't that many um, sets of chambers, particularly in London, that offer common law pupillages. 
most sets of chambers in London um, are sets that offer specialist pupillages in family, crime, civil, commercial work. Um, there are, I would say, about five chambers in London that offer common law pupillages. Um, I think it's much easier to find sets of chambers that offer common law pupillages outside of London. But again, I think um, that is becoming more and more difficult. Um, I, I think there are certainly advantages to doing a common law pupillage. I think that some of the skills that you can acquire in certain areas are transferable to other areas of the law. Um, I think, for example, doing a lot of advocacy in crime will, ass will, 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 will assist with a civil practice, for example, where you might not get as much um, cross-examination experience um, as, as, as quickly as you would in crime. Similarly, you might learn in, in, um, in family law how to um, effectively negotiate, which again might be quite helpful in civil as you become more and more senior and take part in joint settlement meetings and mediations and so on. So I think there are benefits to, 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 doing, um, to having a common law um, background. I would also agree with Joe that it allows you, once you have um, experienced a number of these areas, it then allows you to choose an area that suits you, that fits your, that fits your um, particular interests and that maybe fits your um, lifestyle options as well. And all of these, all of these decisions um, can be delayed until such time that you feel ready to really make a decision on which area of the law you'd like to, um, like to practice. Jane, I wonder whether um, you can talk a little bit about your your experience of coming to um, coming to pursue a mixed practice, um, and also thinking about applying for pupillage and how that might um, uh, your experiences, for example, might help people decide how they how they approach their pupillages um, if they're interested in common law. Well, I started with an emphasis on family law. It wasn't what I started pupillage ever thinking that I would end up doing, it has to be said. It found me rather than me going out searching for it. And that's partly because I, I was initially pupilled to um, a wonderful man who was a, probably the busiest family practitioner in Wales at the time, had work coming out of his ears. And I was thrown into doing mountains of paperwork and going to court with him every day. And he took great pride in when I was on my feet, starting to shovel work my way, which was hugely helpful um, and gave me a really good start. Um, and I fell in love with it, I have to say, uh, over the years. But in the first few years of practice, I, I did a mixed bag as well. I, I can remember going down to the county court and doing a whole range of usual sort of junior possession actions and, you know, small disputes, landlord and tenancy things and uh, doing a building dispute, all sorts of things. And I did crime. Um, I, did, I did a moderate amount of crime. And I have to say that um, over the years, I agree entirely with what uh, both Joseph and Tom have said about the fact that you learn skills from each particular uh, area of specialism that you experience, which can be transferred into whatever you end up doing. And there's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with continuing to do a mixed common law practice um, into, into, the, into the long term future. In fact, when, when I started in Chambers, the majority of practitioners in Cardiff, in, 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 the, in the biggest and strongest sets, were mixed common law practitioners and very good in each area that they, that they worked in. Um, over the years, there's been much more of a push to specialise. I think, and that's partly, I think, just because of the sheer volume of work that comes in. Um, but, and it's easier for clerks to have the same people who they can sort of put in one place and, and keep swapping briefs around amongst themselves. But I agree with, with what each of the others has said, that I think that there is real benefit in taking your time, um, experiencing a wide range of practice areas and learning skills, uh, which, which you can pick up from each. One of the benefits of crime, I think, is that you really focus on evidence and, and the, the rules of evidence, because, you know, this is, people are very hot, you know, admissible evidence, inadmissible evidence. Of course, in crime, you have the issues with hearsay, which isn't the case in family law. Family law hearsay in children cases is admissible, and then it's a question of weight. But 
I think people who only do family law sometimes get really quite lax about the strict rules of evidence and think, actually, it might, it might be all bets are off and you can throw it all in without then starting to break it down and analyze what is the actual evidential worth of all of this material that's being put before the court. And I think if you're on top of that and can really start drawing to people, people to account and say, well, where is the primary source for this evidence? Let's see it. Um, it marks, it marks, marks you out as someone who's taking a more forensic approach to it. Um, and so, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong advocate, I think, for, for a, a mixed common law basis and then finding your feet. And, and I know people in, in my chambers in Cardiff who started off um, doing crime, uh, having done mixed pupillage and, and, you know, the first couple of years retaining some paperwork practice and so on. Um, but as the, as the bottom started to fall out of the criminal market for them, they have moved back to, they've moved back to doing civil. And, and some people have decided to go the other way around because actually they found that civil isn't for them. They don't like sitting in chambers all day doing paperwork and not going to court as often. And they've drifted back to doing crime. So I think it keeps your options open. It's, very, it's, it's a very early stage, I think, at, when you're just facing qualification to commit yourselves to a specialised practice. A lot of people do and are happy with it. But I think if you have the choice, if you have the op opportunity to keep your options open, it's a good thing. Thank you. And um, I just wondered uh, if, if I, uh, Joseph, you could talk about your, your journey for applying for pupillage, uh, maybe on the other end of that. Yeah, so um, I guess my journey probably isn't that um, applicable in the sense that I, I was very lucky and I applied for the, the first chambers I applied for, I actually got pupillage. I also applied for other chambers um, in the same sort of year. Uh, and was dismissed at a few of those and you know nine was the offer that I decided to take up on. I think applying for pupillage is basically the number one question that you know, I get asked. I'm sure Tom has the same experience, you know, what what's the secret to getting A, an interview and B, a pupillage? And the first point is that it's really, it's, it's competitive. Okay, you, you know, you don't expect uh, to be in your first year as an undergraduate uh, and be offered interviews and um, pupillages because unless you know you're top of the tree academically you've got an absolutely brilliant cv it does take time and it takes persistence and very few people do get it in their first year um i think maybe this is something that we might talk about a bit later on just generally about you know how how to structure your application or you know what what chambers are looking for i think that the num the biggest tip i can give people for maximizing their chances of getting a pupillage is to not treat the next, you know, if you're an undergraduate or you're on the GDL, is to start working towards that pupillage sort of now, in, especially in your holidays, taking on internships. If, you, if you're lucky enough that you can afford uh, to do things for free, just work in a solicitor's firm for, for a week or work in, or, you know, apply for mini pupillages or, get something on your CV that shows to Chambers that you this is what you want and you are prepared to work hard for it. Um, I think that's always a good starting point. But certainly on my, on my application form, I was lucky enough that I'd saved up enough money and I went to India and organised a placement there just by emailing somebody to say, look, can I work in, you know, can I just follow a, a lawyer out in, in Delhi for three or four weeks? And that was one of the things that they asked me about in their, um, in my interview, because it just showed it's that something different that, that shows that you're actually very keen. I was very interested in human rights back then. And that was sort of something that I was, I wanted to show to the, to a panel of six or seven strangers that, you know, I'm serious about this and I'm willing to work desperately hard for it. Um, but I'm sure that we'll talk about that a bit later, but I think that's probably a good starting point. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Joe. Tom, could you? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Was, was Nine Gough Square your your first choice, or how how was your experience of the application process? And then possibly, um, Jane, after that, could you perhaps talk us through what your experience on committees have been like when, in terms of looking at applications? My experience of um, applying for pupillage has broadly been the same, really. I mean, I think it's always it's always good advice to um, go to the form first 
to have a look at what um, you would to have a look at the form and think about what you would like to be saying in that form um, at the start of your BPTC year or maybe even before that so that you can have a good idea as to what you'd like to be saying in that form when you come to apply to the sets of chambers that you would like to um, apply to. So think of it, if you like, as a, as a sort of closing speech of a jury trial. Think about what you'd like to be saying at the end of the um, trial and then maybe use that year in between or maybe the two years in between to elicit all of that evidence to go on the mini pupillages that you'd like to be speaking about or to take part in the moots that you'd like to take part in in order to demonstrate an interest in this specific area of the law. So I would always recommend doing that, printing out the form first, um, maybe at the start of the BPTC year or um, maybe yeah maybe about now and having and having a think about what you'd like to be writing about when you come to apply um i i um i went to the law commission after the bptc um which was a fantastic opportunity to speak about a specific um project that i was working on um, and i found that because i was doing that after the bptc that was something that i was asked about in every single pupillage interview that I went to. I was I was always asked, "What are you doing at the law commission? What project are you are you currently involved in? Um, how will it affect your practice?" And and that sort of thing. I would definitely recommend trying to do something that really stands out that can perhaps act as a real talking point in um, in your um, subsequent um, in your subsequent interviews. Um, I, when I applied, um, you could only apply to 12 um, sets of chambers. I think that's changed now, um, Harry, is that right? Um, but I, I, I found that when I was applying, um, most, most people who were applying were, uh, applied for four sets of chambers that they considered to be um, above their reasonable expectations of where they would like to go, four that fell broadly within um, their reasonable expectations and four and four below and I think that that's that's good advice I think you should you should overestimate and underestimate where you, where you'd like to end up and and you should be fine with that with that type of formula um, how you estimate where you where you fall and what your reasonable expectations should be is a difficult question um, I think you a good starting point is the websites of the um, chambers that you'd like to apply to see um, see what see the, the sorts of experiences that the juniors in those sets of chambers have and whether they marry up with um, with your experiences but uh, yes the, the 444 rule was 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 something that um, a number of us in my bptc group um applied and i would recommend doing as well well i'd agree with all of that um that that each of joseph and uh, tom has said and i can shed some light on how at least the chambers I've been involved in approach applications as they come in. Just to give you a sense of the, the scale of the task, when I was chairing one Garden Courts or one GC's uh, pupillage committee, and bear in mind that that is a specialist family law set, we were getting um, around about 240 applications a year for two pupillages. So that was the starting point. And when I returned and rejoined the, the pupillage uh, committee in Cardiff, it was about the same, I think. We were getting somewhere in the region of 200 and something applications, again, then for two pupillages. Years ago, people used, chambers used to be able to offer more pupillages each year. I can remember a time where we had seven pupils in chambers, but I'm afraid that one of the the downsides of the real benefit of pupillages being funded by chambers has been that they can't afford to offer as many pupillages because it comes out of it comes out of chambers. Chambers isn't a, it isn't a big public company. It's a collection of individual self-employed barristers who, who work collectively. So that that I think has reduced generally the number of pupillages around. But how do we do it? First of all, we have we would have a, a an initial sift of the 240 or so applica applications, and the committee does that. How do you sift? We have criteria. We have marking schemes. Marking schemes vary from chambers to chambers. Um, there's a there's a sort of general. You have some there's some general guidance that's out there. 
but it's up to each chambers to set its own criteria, to set its own standardization and marking. I mean, the obvious things that start off are A-level grades, um, the quite what people are going to do about those currently. Um, I think people are going to have to reconsider what they do with A-level grades. But in the past, it's been A-level grades, it's been degree grades or predicted grade, um, and it's obviously then been how you, people have fared in their subsequent examinations. Next thing we look at is scholarships. Has anyone, you know, who's, who's got scholarships already, who doesn't have scholarships? Uh, doesn't matter if you don't have a scholarship, it doesn't mean you won't get a place in chambers, but generally if you have a scholarship, there's some marks that go for that. There is a commitment and relevant experience. Now, obviously nobody's worked as a barrister, but the sort of things which uh, both Tom and Joseph mentioned in terms of starting early, starting to think about what can you do to demonstrate that what you're applying for is something that you have thought about carefully and you really want to do is important. So mini pupillages, um, every chambers I think offers mini pupillages, certainly in, in 30 part place, there's, I, don't think there's, I, there's, I don't think there's a week when we don't have a mini pupil in chambers throughout the year. Um, it's obviously been a bit more complicated with COVID, we haven't been able to do it, but every, apart from that, there's always a mini pupil in chambers. That's a competitive process in itself, and there's, there's somebody who selects who we give mini pupillages to, but there are 50 odd, 48 or so people a year who get the chance with us to come and do a mini pupillage. And I'm, I'm sure lots of other chambers do the same. It doesn't have to be mini pupillage, although you need to be shown to have done some. Um, as I think Joseph said, go and work in a solicitor's office, uh, citizen's advice, there are all sorts of things that, that can be done um, to demonstrate, I mean, I know Harry has been working, I've seen him, Harry's been doing the, the work down at the, um, what do they call it now, the P, the, the, the PS, PS. Was the, was the PSU, was the personal support unit, is now support through court. Um, oh, yeah, that's, I keep, that's a change of name uh, floored me for a moment. Yeah, which is effectively what, it, it's a better version really of citizen's advice because you actually do have people who are studying um, law and, and studying to, to, to be members of the profession who are there um, assisting. Uh, and I'm sure that's the sort of thing that would, you know, that is really helpful and, and relevant on an application. Um, advocacy, you know, I think if you can demonstrate some advocacy experience, not, not necessarily going to court, but mooting, you know, once, once you get started on your, on your training, you, there are plenty of opportunities for mooting. If you've debated at school, that's really helpful. Um, anything, public speaking, anything that you can show that you actually have been someone who can stand up on your hind legs and speak to an audience is helpful. Um, I think think outside the box a bit as well about what isn't necessarily directly related to a profession at the bar, but could be a skill that could be transferable. I'll give you a different example of that. It was my daughter, uh, who's now a doctor, when she was making the very competitive application to get into med school, had to think of similar sort of things that she had to demonstrate to show how she could, uh, she was going to be committed to, to a career in medicine. And one of the things she did when she was about 16 was um, sign up to go tall ship sailing. She put it on her application, put it on her personal statement, and she, she wove it in in a way that actually showed what she'd learned from tall ship sailing that helped with the potential for being a doctor. Even something basic like we had to do, you know, we were on watches, you know, I, I, I was getting up at three in the morning to do the night watch. Well, for medicine, that's quite useful. Someone you can actually wake up at three in the morning be alert, do something responsible, working as a team, working in difficult and, and uncomfortable conditions. Um, it wasn't anything to do with being a doctor, but every interview she went on, and she had interviews on every place that she applied, the one thing they all picked up on was the tall ship sailing. So, you know, I think it's, it's useful to think outside the box and, and try and think of something else that you might have done or um, something else that you can find yourself to do, which you could, a, make yourself stand out and be different from everybody else, and B, use it, weave it in uh, as a relevant skill. Um, what else do we have in the marking schemes? Um, oh, anything that you've done, really, that, that 
that, that isn't necessarily law, law related. You know, if, you, if you've got a talent in music or drama or, or sport or, you know, anything, it's, it's relevant because it shows that you're someone who has a rounded interest in life, that you are somebody who sometimes can, can work with other people. Um, and it just, it, there's usually a category which we don't have a proper name for, but it's usually sort of stellar component. And those sort of things go into that. Um, academic prowess, obviously really important, but I can, I can tell you that I've interviewed on a number of occasions where we've looked down the, the, the list of candidates and there are two or three who really have, you know, the first class from, you know, from the Oxbridge, whatever, you know, with an every, every bangle and bell attached to their applications. And they've been really disappointing when it's come to the interview because they just haven't had that sort of quality that you can see that you know can translate to sitting in an awkward place with a difficult client on a bad day, uh, trying to establish a rapport, trying to build confidence and really just engaging with, with difficult and vulnerable clients who in common law work, that's often the sort of person that you're going to be dealing with. It isn't all walking into a room and dealing with, you know, the managing director of some major multinational, um, which sometimes on some levels doesn't require quite, well, requires different skills, but it, it's a different skill set. So I think there are, there are all sorts of things that you probably don't even know that you already have in your toolkit that you can reflect on and mold to assist an application. If you don't think you've got them, then hopefully you've got time to, to go out and try and acquire some of them. Um, because it's, the mark, it's that marking scheme and it has to be done because, you know, we've all done equal, you know, we've all done the quality training and, and all of that stuff when we're on any of these selection committees. We have to have criteria, we have to mark in a particular way, and we have to be accountable if anyone questions how we have actually made our selections, that we have done it in a totally transparent and fair way. And sometimes that actually inhibits you a bit from that sort of gut reaction that you get when you see something and, and you think, oh, actually, it doesn't quite fit this, and it doesn't quite fit that, but I think there's something about this one. And sometimes if, if that is the case, you can maybe just sort of tweak the, the stellar component um, category to, to, to move uh, into the interview bracket. How many people get interviewed varies greatly. Um, there was a time at 1GC when we used to interview 40 um, over a whole weekend um, in groups of four to two interviewees in each panel. And then we decided that that wasn't actually giving us parity and we needed to have the same people interviewing everybody um, because comparisons weren't working properly. Um, and I think we reduced it to 20 and did 10 a day on a Saturday and a Sunday you know, on a very, very exhausting weekend um, to, to try and find the, uh, the, best, the best pair from that. But um, what I can tell you, and I think is something worth remembering and holding on to, is that I know I, I can think of at least two candidates who we interviewed at a point where they had graduated, they were doing their conversion courses and they hadn't started the bar course and had made it through to the interview stage and had done very well in the interview stage and had really got down to the last sort of four or so, but didn't make it to the two who were selected that year. And they came back, they, not in the same year group, but they, they each came back a year later and absolutely nailed it, just totally nailed it second time round because they had used that year and the experience that they'd had in, I think even just going through the interview process once probably helped. Um, and the one in particular has been and, and is still an, a real rising star um, at the Family Bar in London. She's been, you know, nominated for sort of Family Law Junior of the Year and all that sort of thing. So it just goes to show that 
getting knocked back isn't the end. It really isn't. And I think if you, if you really persevere and you work hard to keep enhancing what you have to bring to a pupillage and, and to a tenancy, then, you know, with luck, there's always an element of luck, I think. I don't think you can ever exclude luck. But with luck, then you should be able, you should succeed. I mean, I do worry, I have to say about the moment, because recruitment has finished. It, no, people have not done pupillage selection this year in a lot of chambers. We haven't. I don't know. Have you done them, have you done them in number nine, Joseph? No, so this year, unfortunately, we didn't offer, I think we were going to offer, and I think the pandemic put the kibosh on that, but I think nine and 30 have both been very consistent in offering at least one a year, if not two, yeah. uh, for the last few years. And, yeah. you know, you're going to see a lot of pup uh, chambers offering pupillage, I think, this coming March to make up for the lack of an intake next last year. So yeah. I wouldn't worry about that at all. No, well, I think I think that we've resolved to take three, if not four, I think, um, in the next round. So hopefully that will give some catch up on that, because otherwise, um, you know, it's, it's pretty a daunting prospect to think that there are two years effectively competing against one another. But I, I hope that most chambers are going to uh, take the same view that we have on that. Thank you. That's really helpful and actually very encouraging uh, for people who have seen the, the rollout and the, the effect that, that the pandemic has had uh, on pupillage uh, offer, as well as um, the opportunities for doing mini pupillages. That's really, really helpful. Um, Tom, I just was going to ask you uh, about your your day uh, today practice, and I think it's really um, <laughs> really pertinent that your your days in court seem to be longer, shorter, or or very very unpredictable. So maybe we, it's a good time to start with you, I think, Tom, to talk about your day to day practice. Yes, of course. Um, well, today I had I had two matters in my diary today. I had I had the um, brief. On the first matter uh, on Friday of last week, and I had the brief on the afternoon matter uh, yesterday evening. So life at the common law bar at the junior end is very last minute, and you do have to be prepared to be adaptable and comfortable sometimes in going into um, a situation, going into court without necessarily having as much time as you would like to read the ins and outs of every single aspect of the application or the ins and outs of every single aspect of the law. You do have to be prepared at the common law bar to often think on your feet. Um, that, that, that's true in two respects. Firstly, it's true uh, in, in, in the sense that you will have often very little time to prepare um, an application. And it's also true in the sense that you'll be doing um, a variety of areas of the law. Um, I've, I've prepared a list of all of the various different applications and, and hearings that I did last week as a sort of as an, as an example of a typical week that you can um, expect as a junior in a classic common law set. And I really do mean that nine golf chambers is a common law set. We have we have common we have crime practitioners. We have family practitioners. We have civil practitioners, PI and clinic. We have employment practitioners. Um, and and uh, court protection practitioners, police practitioners. Um, and again, as, as Jane said, there are many members of chambers that actually do um, more than more than one, more than two, more than three areas of practice as well. It's not just that we have members of chambers that are specialists within those fields. Um, we, we do have practitioners that continue to overlap in various different areas, um, a practice which I think is, is very attractive. Uh, Last week, I had a um, police action on the um, Monday where I was representing um, a police force. On the um, Tuesday, I had a strikeout application um, in person in Tunbridge Wells Town Hall. Um, we had to go in person because, because Tunbridge Wells Town Hall didn't have the remote um, hearing facilities that, we, um, that it needed to offer a remote hearing. So a strikeout application um, in, uh, in Tunbridge Wells for a claimant. Um, on the Wednesday, I had a court of protection directions hearing that was listed for um, an hour uh, and ended up being, I think, three, three hours or four hours. Um, I also had a fast track trial in a civil case uh, where the issue was, was just causation. 
Um, so that was a relatively short um, hearing. That's a that's a um, relatively a fast track trial is a relatively straightforward um, civil matter. Um, and then I had a papers day with a um, round table meeting. So life at the common law bar is is very varied indeed. Um, that is a that is a typical uh, week at the common law bar. Um, my my practice probably has become more geared towards um, civil and family and court protection as I've moved through. I, I, I find that I'm doing less crime and less police work um, now, but that's not to say that I don't enjoy getting briefs in crime and in police work. Um, I, I like the fact that I have still a broad common law practice and I, and I welcome it. Um, at Nine Gough Chambers, you are required to do all areas of the law um, for three years. And after your three years is up, um, you then have a meeting with the clerks and then the clerks say, um, you know, what have you enjoyed? What have you, what have you, uh, what would you like to continue doing? Um, and then, and then from there, you can decide if you want to start to specialize in a particular area. You don't have to, um, a lot of, a lot of juniors don't after that three year period, because they've got to a stage where they enjoy, um, all, all areas that they are doing at that stage. Um, I, I would say, um, I'm, I'm conscious that that COVID-19 is a separate issue on the on the agenda, but I would say that having that broad common law practice has proved particularly helpful um, since March 2020. Um, the county court, and I and I won't stray too much into this because I don't want it to um, mess with your um, order, uh, Philip. But I would say that the county court was a little slower um, than, say, the family court in responding to the um, public health crisis. Now, having a broad um, common law practice, which allows you to jump between various different areas because you've got the expertise and the clerking to be able to jump around a little, um, is perhaps um, a little bit more um, comfortable for, for some people. So that, there we go, there is, a, there is a typical week at the junior common law bar. Thank you, Tom. I mean, I see, Joe, that you've um, answered sort of partly what, what, what a working week looks like for you. For, for you. Yeah. Um, but how would you say it's your, that, would you say there's been any sort of noticeable change in your, in your formative years since, since pupillage? What, what would you say you notice about this, sort of the uptake of work as opposed to the stuff that you would have done in your first and second six? I think the, the main point is that it swings and roundabouts. So some days you will, as Tom, you know, as Tom's found now, you'll be in court till you know, 6 p.m. You might then have a brief to prepare for the next morning, which you might be prepping until eight, nine o'clock at night. But the point is that that's not every day. Just to give you an example, today I had a conference at 10 o'clock in the morning that finished at 11. And I, you know, I prepped everything that I'd really been given papers for. So that, I, you know, I was finished at 11 o'clock today. Now that's, that's really the great thing about the bar is as a solicitor, you're, you know, you're clocking back in and you're staying in your office until five, six o'clock. But at the bar, that that rest of the day is to yourself. So, you know, I, you know, I basically did whatever I wanted really until 6 p.m. tonight. Now, tomorrow, I've got two hearings, one at 10 o'clock in the morning and then straight into a, a case opposite Tom at two o'clock. Uh, and I know I haven't had papers for my case on Thursday yet, which are going to come in at some point tomorrow. So tomorrow is going to be the exact opposite of today. It's going to be, you know, court twice in the day and then papers in the evening. Uh, but that's sort of a really good microcosm of what the bar is like. There are some days that you think this is unbelievable. How how has this happened? You know, I've got, you know, I've got the rest of the day off and I've earned X amount of money. And there's other days where you think this is a hell on earth. You know, how on earth am I going to sleep tonight? But it, it all swings and roundabouts. But in terms of like how work has moved on, I think when you start when you start at the bar you find yourself getting into all sorts of bizarre situations with clients and crazy encounters and i think that's just your your own inexperience not being able to manage a client properly and allowing sort of the client to run away with things a little bit and you end up getting into really mental situations now that happens less and less i think as you get older and you become a little bit more experienced and you can start managing people a little bit better um obviously the the more senior you get the more um complicated the work will become the more challenging the issues in the case 
uh, but that's you know that's any industry so i don't think the bar is different to any other industry like that you will you will not be chucked in at the deep end or at least any self-respecting chambers that looks after its tenants will not do that to you you will be given work that is relevant to your level of call and you'll all be taught on the bar course the code of ethics uh, that if you get given a case that you simply don't feel ready for that's not a problem at all and nobody looks down on it uh, i've given cases back I'm sure Tom may have done, and I'm sure Jane may have done um, many moons ago. So, you know, it happens to literally everybody that you sometimes feel that this is maybe slightly above your calling. Um, and that's you know, one of the nice things about the bar is, yes, you have a duty to, to each case, but there's nothing to say that you should be acting uh, above and beyond your own competencies. But that obviously happens less and less the more experienced you get into your practice. And I think following on from that, I'd say that one of the great strengths of a good, strong set of chambers is the support that you can get from other members of chambers. I mean, I, I, I would be really disappointed if any member of any chambers that I've ever been associated with felt that they couldn't at eight o'clock, nine o'clock, even 10 o'clock at night when they are preparing a brief that they've only picked up at half past five, six o'clock that evening, that they couldn't actually pick up the phone and phone one of us if there was anything that they felt they needed to, to talk over, uh, double check or discuss. And I, and I think that that would apply in pretty much any set of, you know, a, a, any decent set of chambers that people, people want their junior tenants and their pupils to succeed. They want them to do well and they, they want to be supported. Thank you. Uh, again, really interesting and uh, interesting to hear how people's practices have developed from the early days going on to uh, more established practice. Uh, and, and Jane, could you just give us a flavour of uh, your practice on a day to day basis coming from the more senior end? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I, I tend these days to be involved in lengthy cases. Um, I, I don't work from day to day very often unless it's a case management or, or, or something like for or having a consultation in preparation for one of those big cases. I mean, this year, for example, my year has been mostly dominated by one case, actually, which started just before Christmas, um, wasn't, complete, wasn't able to get off the ground properly, although we had about six or seven days then, went into, started in January, I think towards the end of January, um, listed for, I can't remember how, much, how long it was actually listed for originally, six weeks, something like that. For a whole combination of reasons, it ended up taking a whole lot longer than that. Um, and um, moved into COVID, remote hearings and so on and so on. Um, that's not entirely unusual for me because I, I work now almost exclusively in childcare work, child protection, you know, the sort of most complex child abuse cases, which you know, can be, they're pretty grim at times and they, they can be enormously complicated and, and multi-party. Uh, to give you an example, uh, when we were working on that case on remote hearing, each day we had, I think, 27 participants on, uh, on remote access. By the time we had all the, the, client, the, the parties, the interveners, the silks, the juniors, the solicitors, the intermediaries uh, who were needed for several of the vulnerable people who were also involved in it, the judge and so on. Um, and, and so I tend to work, I think to have a 10 day case would be about the minimum of, of, of what I do. So it's all very intense uh, for bursts of time. This week, I've had a really quiet week. I mean, that's partly because I took, I've taken it off in prep to prepare for something that's coming up. I've got an eight week listing in January, um, but it's been nice to be at home and to be able to manage my time a bit. Uh, so it's, it's very different from life at the junior bar. Um, and life as a silk doesn't always give you the indulgence of being able to take a week off to, to just to prepare. I've had, I've had times when I've been back to back, you know, you finish, you finish a big case at six o'clock, I thought, you know, half past four, whatever, on a Friday, spend the weekend writing your closing submissions before you're starting another big one on Monday. And it's, it's knackering to be honest. I mean, it really can be. And it's the same at the junior bar. I mean, it's uh, once you get into your stride, I'm, I'm not saying this to put you off, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but I think you need a realistic view on how life can be 
Uh, my husband and I were speaking, he's a solicitor uh, uh, in, with his own practice. And we were saying only the other day how it has been that for most of our married life, we've never ever taken social commitments in the week because we just can't, we just can't rely on being able to say, yeah, we can come around for dinner on Wednesday because odds are one or other of us has to cancel. Um, either because someone's not back in time or because you've got work to do or something like that. So it is, it is very demanding. I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna dress that up and pretend it isn't, but it is so rewarding. You know, I mean, I, I still get a, a wonderful buzz from what I do. I love it. I, you know, some years into being a, a barrister, suddenly I hadn't even realized, hadn't, hadn't thought it through, shows how bright I am, I suppose, that it hadn't occurred to me that the pathway to being a judge was actually to be a, a barrister or a solicitor, but in those days it was mostly being a barrister. Um, and it was only when uh, I was appointed an assistant recorder, because that was, that was the route into being a recorder in those days, that it occurred to me that there was this potential pathway to, to a judicial career. And I have thought about it from time to time. And I, I just, it's never appealed to me. I like doing it for the, you know, the odd week here and there, it's fine. But I think, the, the satisfaction and the buzz that you get from being an advocate and, and, and just dealing with whatever it throws at you. And it's not easy sometimes. I mean, it really isn't. But at the end of the day, I can't think of many occasions when I've come out of court and not thought that it was, it was, it was an experience worth having. Um, it's, uh, yeah. Sorry, I've rambled off the point. <laughs> no, I, I, that was very really interesting, I think, and, yeah. uh, and, and really passionate about that, I can see. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think that it's, if you feel that passion, it will carry you through the tough times. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I think, it, well, thank you all for, for that. I think it's, a, there's a lot of important messages there about, as you say, tempering expectations, but also maintaining that passion for, for the job that, you hope that we'll all hopefully want to do for however many years. Um, I'm aware that we're getting close to sort of the, the Q&A time. For anybody who still has any burning questions, I'm aware that Joe has been answering a few in the chat and that um, uh, Philip and Tom have, have, have addressed some in the Q&A box. Anybody who does have any remaining questions, um, stick them in the Q&A the Q box rather than the chat box and we will um, put them to the panellists uh, when we can. Um, we have, we've touched on it, we'll say every, every, uh, each of the panellists has touched upon it, already but I wonder perhaps before we move on to to questions to, to each of you but say start starting with Tom how in anticipation that um, many of us on this call will will end up working at the bar in in the next few years how have the courts responded to to the coronavirus what apart from simply doing remote hearings what would you say is that that future practitioners can expect if the, the sort of um, amalgamation of remote hearings and, and attending face-to-face -face, um, continues? Um, I think it's a very good question. I think that, that those applying for pupillage now can expect remote hearings and hybrid hearings to be a common feature of their life at the bar. Mm -hmm. um, the response from the courts um, depends on the various different jurisdiction that you're looking at. Um, the, the county court, took a little longer to move over to remote working. And um, that's probably because it worked predominantly uh, with paper files, believe it or not, where um, the, um, the Crown Court um, operated predominantly using an electronic system as did predominantly the family court for public law work. Um, and so the county court took, took quite a long time. It, my experience was that it moved over to doing a lot of hearings over the phone first before developing the CVP system that it's now um, using frequently and successfully. Um, the um, family court, I think, was quicker to, to move over to remote working. I think there was only a period of about two to three weeks where the family court and the court of protection had to, had to grapple with which system um, it was going to be using. There, have, there has been various different changes along, along, the, uh, along the way since, since March, but broadly speaking, um, the family court has, has been using a, um, a remote system that works quite well. It's a lot more effective in many ways 
um, um, you can achieve a lot more. Um, if you do a lot of local authority work, for example, you can have your um, you can have various different screens in front of you. You can't see now, but I've got about three. Um, and you can have on one screen your draft order. You can have on another screen the submissions that you want to be making. You can have on another screen the bundle. So it's quite um, it's quite effective um, from an advocate's perspective. I think the family court is currently grappling with the extent to which parents are able to deal with remote um, remote um, working. I think it will certainly be a feature of any future practitioner's life at at, um, at the bar. Um, I definitely think it's it's working well, um, and I definitely think that it's here to stay. I'd agree with that. I think that um, certainly the procedural hearings, I can't see us ever going back to dealing with those uh, on a basis that everyone is required to be present. Um, it's, it's, it's really so inefficient in terms of time and, uh, and professional energy. And we now know that we can do it. Um, I think the hybrid hearing is probably the way forward for the, for the more complex hearings, because it is, it is a point. I mean, Tom is absolutely right that it is much harder for, in, in family cases in particular, the parents to be isolated um, at the moment with COVID. It's been, it's been of necessity. People have had to be in their homes uh, when even when their solicitor's offices and barristers' chambers were closed uh, in, in the worst times. But increasingly, as things started to open up before they start to close down again, um, people have been able to go into their solicitor's office or to, or to counsel's chambers, uh, which has happened on, on, on occasions, in order to give their evidence from there so that at least they have some support from their legal team. And it may not be that the whole team is there. I mean, I, I haven't actually been anywhere other than in this room doing any work since the 23rd of March. And I've been working pretty much flat out since then. But I'm in the privileged position that I have a junior in, in my cases, and the poor junior is the person who has been dealing more. I mean, we, I see the client for a meeting before every hearing in the mornings. We, have, we do it, we do it on Teams. Um, at the breaks, we have meetings and we're constantly on WhatsApp. Um, so we have ways of keeping in touch. But I absolutely agree, Tom, I don't think we're ever going to go back to everyone going to court um, for every hearing that, that is necessary. And I think a real benefit of that is that it will help reduce the hours of a working day because you won't have to be finishing in court in Peterborough or somewhere, uh, you know, at half past four, five o'clock, just missing your train to get back to London or wherever it is that you're going to. Um, and, and then having to start all over again for the, for the next day. Um, I mean, I, I did a directions hearing in Liverpool recently at nine o'clock in the morning, and I went back into a full hearing, wherever it was, I can't remember where the hearing was meant to be, probably somebody, I think it probably was a Cardiff hearing actually, um, by 10 o'clock. So, you know, I couldn't have done that if we hadn't been able to do it remotely, and I can't see us ever going back. Thank you. Um, I just then wondered, uh, we have, uh, uh, counsel from both London and the circuits, yeah, admittedly from the uh, the Welsh circuits, but uh, uh, but I just wondered whether there are perceptions, at least, or realities of differences between common law uh, work within London and common law work outside of London on the circuits, mm. and implications for career advancement and developing your own practices, for example. Yeah. Based on circuit, the habitat is a lot smaller and you see a lot of the same faces a lot more often, which probably lends itself to people being pleasanter. I know London just has a reputation of people being a bit more cutthroat. I haven't practiced a lot of, in London, but you will always see the same faces in a circuit roving room. And I know it's the same whether you're on the northern circuit up in you know the northeast, the south, southeast, you know, all of these different circuits, you usually see the same sorts of faces. You know, even you know, I'm against Tom tomorrow, I've appeared in front of um Jane when Jane's been sitting on the bench. There isn't uh, you know a barrister or solicitor really that you I haven't been involved in a case with and I've been here, you know, two years. And I think that actually lends itself to a much more pleasant dialogue with other practitioners in, in your practice because you don't want to be the person 
that um, is seen to be, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being difficult, you know, plenty of people are difficult, but it's being, um, I guess, just being pleasant and, and just being kind to people as well, which makes a big difference to people's well-being as well. Uh, and, you know, that's why I think, you know, practicing out in Wales, at least, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely, really. It's a very nice environment to practice in. Um, but I, I think Tom's probably the best person to answer because I know he does a considerable amount of work in London and off circuit, mm. uh, as does Jane, obviously. Uh, well, I was I was also about to pass the buck over to Jane as well because um, f f for those reasons, I, yes, I, I mean I'm I'm based in Chambers in in London, but I'm from South Wales and I'm very proud of my of my Welsh um, background, and so any opportunity to go to Wales. Um, I'm I'm at Paddington. Um, my clerks often they also know that I um, uh, have an interest in developing a practice in 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 Wales, and so any Welsh um, work that comes into Chambers, it often uh, I often sort of get 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 first dibs if you like, um, and I think that's an important point for anyone thinking about practicing in London or uh, or somewhere outside of London. You should remember that you can have you, your practice at the bar is very fluid and you can have a practice from a set of chambers in one geographical location and then develop a practice in another part of the jurisdiction very easily um i mean you 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 could you could have you could be a you could be a member of more than one chambers even and and have um and have clerks operating your sort of southeastern practice and clerks operating your Welsh practice. That's also a, a, a common thing at the bar. It's a lot more fluid than being um, being based within an office in a, in a, in a solicitor's firm. Um, your, your client base can, can be very broad um, at the bar. Um, in terms of differences between um, my, my, my cases in Wales and my cases in London, um, I haven't experienced that much difference between between practitioners in London and practitioners in 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 Wales. Um, I find that it's very much dependent on personalities, and there are there are various different personalities in in, in both both sides of the border. So I, I don't think there's any anything specific about London or anything specific about Wales in my in my own experience that I can that I can actually pinpoint. Um, that, and I think that's all. That's all I can. All I can really. All, all, all I can really say about that. I think. I think Jane is probably the the best person to answer this this question. Well, thank you for that. Um, I can, in the sense that obviously I, I have experience of practicing in a whole range of areas, both not just in the in the South Wales region, uh, but also in other regions around the country, and also um, as 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 a full-time practitioner in London. Um, of course, I wasn't doing that as a, as a common law practitioner um, in a mix, in a, with a mixed practice. I was doing that as a family specialist. And so um, I'm not sure that, I think the family, the family bar is a very, very close-knit bar. Um, I think it probably stems from the nature of the work that we do and the emotional pressures that it brings to those who practice in it that although we fight our corners very hard, there is a very strong uh, collegiate atmosphere at the family bar where people do their best to find ways through um, to get the best outcomes for, for clients and well, in, in the end for children mostly, um, or I suppose, you know, in the financial side then um, to get the best outcome they can in that. And, and I have found that wherever I go around the country, the family practitioners are very similar. And even you know, in, in London, where I know in certain aspects of it, maybe in the, the big money side of it, um, there's, there's, it's, it's a much more tense uh, and, and possibly aggressive atmosphere. But broadly speaking, um, I, I can't say that there's a strong difference uh, between being a family practitioner at any level uh, in London or elsewhere around the country. I mean, I think that a very striking difference as a junior that I would note is the question about travel. Um, and it certainly struck me when I was practicing in London, um, albeit I was then in Silk, but speaking and, and observing the juniors in, in, in my chambers there, 
the amount of traveling that they were having to do from day to day, um, literally the length and breadth of the country, it was nothing to be in, in Lincoln or Norwich one day, Ipswich, and in Portsmouth the next, um, which coming from having been a junior in Cardiff where, you know, you felt it was a bit of a do if you had to get up in the morning to go to Haverford West, you know, which is nothing like as, you know, it's a two hour drive tops, an hour and a half on a good day without speed cameras. Um, but it, it was a different world. And I think that the, that, the, that, that the ardors of travel that the junior bar in London have to make sometimes is, uh, it is extraordinary. And, and, and I think that, you know, people like Joseph and me who, live a pretty comfortable life, you know, I think it has to be said, living in, a, in, a, in an area where we're surrounded by, uh, you know, the we're easily accessible to many places of great natural beauty. And Cardiff's a nice city anyway. Um, and, you know, where's, where do you go, Joseph? Cardiff, Pontypridd, Newport, Swansea? Yeah, all of those, I think all of those places, but since the pandemic, it's just, you yeah, know. Well, it's just, a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just it doesn't compare, you know, we don't have to make, we, we, we're not up getting a 6.30 train no. um, and not getting back till eight o'clock at night. So I think that's, I mean, maybe that Tom's experience isn't like that, but I mean, that's certainly what I observed um, with the family practitioners at 1GC. Hopefully, as we were saying, with more uh, remote hearings coming into the mix, that might be alleviated, but it's not going to, that won't go away completely when things get back to normal. Well, thank you, thank you all. And I, I think we could sort of talk at length for, for the experiences and potential for, for a career at the bar. I think we will, we are beginning to run a little short of time. I'm aware that we've, we've arranged to finish at half past seven. We will do our best to finish at half past seven. Um, so I will turn, if I may, to a couple of the questions. I notice. Uh, quite a few have come up about uh, is it dis is it dis disadvantageous to say during uh, an application that you're applying for a common law pupillage as you are yet to make up your mind as to which area you wish to specialise in and if, if indeed you do and I know there are a few other questions um, along alongside that about uh, having a difficulty uh, choosing a genuine interest in one area of law I'm um, just about to type an answer to that, Harry, because... <laughs> well, would you, would you yeah. like to answer it? Um, just I will, yes. orally, Briefly, orally. Then, I absolutely please. will. I don't, I, from my, if I'm on the pupillage committee, I don't think it does, because I don't think, I think it's unrealistic to expect someone who's applying to a common law set to, uh, to, to have a, a, a clear view about exactly how they want to direct themselves. And I think it's actually healthy to have an open mind. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, I'm obviously not on committees that choose pupillage, but any any chambers that expects you as a, you know, future pupil to not to be open minded about the area of law that you're interested in, they're probably not worth applying to anyway. You know, it's, it's really do not worry about that. Um, you literally know very, very little when you make your application to pupillage and the, the applicants who do well are the ones who accept that. And are ready to learn and that's that's as simple as you're never going to know everything as a first year pupil no matter how good your grades are yeah, I, I would also agree i think it'd be a very good answer actually in a pupillage interview to say i don't know which area of the law i want to practice i want to try them all out first before i decide which one i want to do i think that's actually a very mature um, answer i should say that all of these things are very subjective i i don't know what the pupillage committee lines of members would actually how they would respond to that I was on the receiving end of that sort of answer, I would think that would be quite a mature um, answer to give. Thank you. We've got some questions here around uh, uh, pu mini pupillages um, and also uh, time up for vacation schemes. So um, there's some questions about does it does it matter that you d haven't done a, uh, a mini at the chambers that you're going to apply to? Uh, but also, uh, is there a value in undertaking vacation schemes at uh, law firms uh, to show evidence or does it evidence of interest in, in wider law or does it show uh, a lack of clarity and um, motivation to be at the bar? OK, well, shall I take Emily's question first? Um, does it matter if, if mini pupillages aren't at your chambers? No, it really doesn't. 
um, because we all recognize that not everyone can get, you know, can obtain many pupillages um, in the places that they necessarily need to be. And there might be all sorts of reasons for that, uh, least, least of which, or, or prime of which, is actually availability of mini pupillages. When we're looking at mini pupillages, we're looking at, at somebody's commitment to give up time and to, to spend some time exploring what it's like to be a barrister. And, and I haven't ruled against people when, when I was in a specialist family chambers, the fact that people had done mini pupillages in mixed common law sets or, or other specialist sets, I don't necessarily rule against them for the reason that we were discussing it with the previous question, that actually I think it's really sensible to cast your net and look at other areas of law before then committing. And if you've then honed your application down to say, but I particularly want to, to apply to your chambers because X, Y, and Z. And I think that's really important is actually being able to pitch your application to your chambers as well, because I think there is a bit, I, I, I'm not sure, I haven't done pupillage now for the last two years, I think. And they, I think they've changed it slightly now with the forms and, and so on. But um, I hope that you can personalize a bit for the particular chambers that you're applying to. Um, is, is that the case now, Joseph? Do you know? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I was going to give a very similar answer, which is just usually common sense. You know, if, if don't say how much you enjoy crime when applying to a family law set of chambers, you know, it's just just really basic stuff. Um, I think I was going to ask you as well, Jane, because I've just seen a, a question in the chat. And apologies if, Philip, Philip, you were going to ask this anyway, but I think it's important because we address all these questions to lots of undergrads who are there um, sort of quite young starting out on their careers but there's a question here from Nick which talks about um you know I'm asking this to you because to my knowledge neither me nor Tom have children and I think that's probably incorrect um and given as you're a parent I think Nick, Nick's asking if you have any tips for successfully managing your family and work life oh, God. Um, have you got any tips <laughs> for parents entering the profession because you know I think your chambers has recently taken on a a mature pupil um if I'm, if I'm not correct, I think there was a, a criminal practitioner who's, who's been taken on who's in his late forties or something like that. So, you know, it does happen quite often that people who are more mature come into the bar, but have you got any uh, specific experience with that, Jane? Oh, well, on, what, on parent, being a parent at the bar, it's tough, you know, it's, it is difficult. Um, you know, when I started at the bar, I was, you know, straight out of, you know, I just university, bar finals, pupillage, single, you know, then you know got married i think I, i'd been pregnant for about 10 years by the time i got married two children within 20 within 20 months of one another um and yeah it's ask my children i don't know ask my children how i managed it they they, they turned out all right let me say that how they how they experienced their childhood goodness only knows i mean i was never away when, during their during their formative years, I was never away. I was lucky because I was working principally in Cardiff back then, and I was never away at night. I was always home. Um, sometimes I was late getting home because I was, you know, late con or stuck at court or whatever. But I, I was always there, and um, it was only in later years that I started my uh, my, my great journeys around the length and breadth of the uh, of England and Wales. Um, it is it is difficult. Um, Tips, I don't know, you just need to have good support and good backup. You know, you need you need to know that you've got someone in place when your child wakes up in the morning and, 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 and throws up and can't go to school. You need to be able to, to manage that system. And it really, it does put pressures and it is, it's not easy. Um, but everybody manages it, you know. I mean, every, everybody who's a practice, well, not everyone, but you know, the vast majority of the people in practice at the bar, certainly in my chambers, have children. I, probably half of the people in chambers now are, well, I think we're a 50-50 male-female split pretty much. Everyone, everyone has their responsibilities and somehow, you know, you just have to find ways around it. Sometimes it involves throwing some money at it, you know, to get proper childcare in place. If you're lucky, you've got family support, but it's, um, it is an added pressure. I suppose feeding off of that, as I'm aware, there's another question um, about uh, well-being at the bar, which which came up, I think, um, towards towards the beginning of the panel. But um, Tom, perhaps if you could answer that, what would you say? I, I, I can imagine there's it's going to be an, in the affirmative. Has has the remote work 
um, helped in terms of your well-being at the bar? Or was, as perhaps was alluded to earlier, has it, is it, has it gone the other way? Do you find yourself actually having to go, uh, do you find yourself inundated a bit more now that everything's done remotely as opposed to um, face-to-face? Um, I, I, Jane asked earlier if I travel a lot. I do. I did before um, before lockdown. I, I used to travel a lot. I, I would travel very far every single day. Um, now I can get up a little later and I can go to bed um, a little earlier. Um, and that really helps with well-being, I think. The trade-off, of course, is that I don't see my friends in chambers as frequently. And I don't see my lovely colleagues uh, in court as frequently. Um, of one of the nice things I have found about my first three years in practice is the is the chats that you have with your opponents, um, either before going into court or the chats that you have with your opponents after an application that maybe the judge has been particularly difficult, and you want to just have a have a bit of a chat about it and and unwind, and that's an important process, particularly at the junior bar, particularly at the junior common law bar. Um, I can remember doing some applications in areas of the law that I was unfamiliar with and speaking to more experienced counsel on the other side about how I could do the application differently if I was if I was to do it again. And, and that really helps with your well-being, just to know that you're on the right lines. There's less scope for that in, in the remote world. Um, and there's obviously less scope to do other broad and nice things in Grey's Inn and, and so on. So that has a sort of negative impact, but I think on, on balance... I would say that remote working um, must must improve um, a a person's well-being. Speaking generally, um, it allows you perhaps after an application, as opposed to get jumping on a train and get and going back to chambers, it allows you perhaps to go for a run over lunch, or to make sure that you actually keep keep hydrated during the day, because you don't have to carry you know carry your water around with you. All of these things are possible um, with with remote working that weren't possible before. So I would say on balance, it has improved things. Um, you, I, th I think it will take some time for the bar to, 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 to get around all of the, the various different negatives, which I outlined at the beginning, uh, meeting, meeting colleagues, possibly remotely for, for drinks and so on. I mean, we started to do that at Langhoff Chambers to have sort of weekly catch ups on Zoom with the juniors to make sure that everyone's sort of OK and we're checking in with each other. That's only really starting to take effect now. Hopefully we can get to a place where that's a regular feature of, of, of life at the junior end. Um, but on balance, I would say it's definitely improved wellbeing. Thank you, Tom. I don't know if anyone else had any further comments to add. I'm just going to um, allude to the question about uh, doing the GDL in terms of when you actually uh, learn the law needed. I mean, I'm someone who went through the GDL and I'm, I'm back on now. You do start learning about stuff. But um, Joe, when would you say that, I think the example given the question is family law, when, when did you start to feel as if you l began to learn law properly or uh, law that was applicable to to practice? Did it did it come to you on the bar or was it more that you when you found yourself in pupillage, that's when it really started to kick in? Yes, so I didn't do any family law modules on the GDL or the bar course, um, actually. And I predominantly practice in family. I think people are quick to say, oh, I don't use anything I learned on the GDL or the bar course in, in practice. But I think you do learn just really basic stuff, just how to address judges, you know, the, the priority of court systems, et cetera. So there are, there are really basic things you'll learn on the GDL that, that will be useful. Similarly, in the bar course, you learn a lot about advocacy. That's, that's pretty key. But I think the most of the stuff that you learn from family law I mean, the bar is and practice is so varied that there's going to be no, you're never going to have a, an answer in a textbook to a case that you'll have. Each case is different. And I think most of it is, is you learn it either in your second six, first or second six, or really in the first few months that you're doing it, because that's when it, you know, it matters. And that's when you're, you're actually advising real people rather than just, you know, a, a problem on a piece of paper. Um, so it's certainly, you know, pay attention to your bar course and GDL and results on that uh, can be really beneficial to pupil age. I mean, just giving some people some, some hope, you know, I didn't do very well at all in my A-levels. I think I got, you know, three Bs, uh, but I've managed to get it together on my um, on my degree, came out with first class honours, which sort of gave me the, the, the open door to, to get into pupilages. Um, so, you know, academic achievements are very important, especially in London. Uh, London sets will expect 
you know, top of the tree academics. But that's not to say that if you come out of university with a 2-1, um, you know, even a high 2-2 with very good grades, th th that isn't an absolute bar at all to, to the profession. I know I've sort of deviated slightly back towards, you know, what it takes to get there, because the most important thing and what should all be all of your priorities is simply getting a pupillage. Uh, I think if you're good enough to get a pupillage, you'll probably figure out the rest of it later. But that's got to be your number one priority is getting getting your foot in that door. Uh, there is a question, thank you, uh, that um, Jane has answered in, in uh, Q&A, but I think it's a, a, an important question that might be useful generally, and that's about uh, it providing evidence for why you have a particular interest in law beyond the simple, uh, I, I have a genuine interest in, and um, any advice uh, maybe that people may have uh, for that question, uh, I think is a common, it's a common apprehension, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah so think, sorry go on Jane no I'm, go on Jane no and I, I think what I, what I put on the on, on, on the board really was uh, that it's 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 fine to say I have a genuine interest in but I think the next question well, why what is it that's triggered your interest in that topic you know what's 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 drawn you to it um, and so I think you shouldn't really just say I have a genuine interest you need to be able to explain why and there must be something because otherwise you wouldn't have a genuine interest in it. So just pat it a bit. Even evidence-based. Yeah, I, I think there's no right or wrong answer, but what's important is why you have a genuine, mm -hmm. ge genuine interest, but also how you express your answer. So not so much as in like, you know, what accent you have or what, you know, the big words that you use. It's just, can you, can you, are you able to speak intelligently to a group of strangers and explore a concept that can be quite difficult which is you know that is advocacy so it's important why you have a general interest but also how you're able to communicate that because verbal and written communication that that's the foundations uh, you know practice at the bar mm. well can i just add that and, and this is a really basic point and i'm sure you're all going to think oh god of course i would be really careful about how i have written my application but check it, double check it, triple check it, get someone else to, to proofread it for you to make sure that you don't have some stupid typing error, punctuation error, uh, spelling mistake or something like that. Because as Joseph really very properly said, the written word is every bit as important as the oral word. When you're submitting a document to a court, it doesn't, it's, it's just shameful if it's peppered with, with careless errors. And I know that we have in the past when looking at people's applications for pupillage, positively marked people down if they've actually not had that degree of care just to the, to the detail of the written words. It's not the substance of it, it's actually the accuracy of getting something down on a piece of paper. I think there's a role for greys in there as well. When I was applying for pupillage, I actually sent my application form into the education department to greys in. Oh. And, um, then it was sent on at the time to the master of students, Christopher, um, Christopher Russell, Master Russell. And he looked through my application for me and said, um, maybe you should sort of put a different emphasis on this or you should, you should maybe change this in, in, in some way. You've, you've, you've misspelled this. Tom, and it came out a much better form. So there's definitely a role for Gray's in, in, in that process as well. You know, to contact the education department, see if there's any barrister that's around. Tony Charles has appeared. Um, uh, see if there's a barrister who's around, who's going to be willing to um, look at your form for you. I'm sure that they will be um, delighted to help in any way that they can. That's a very good point. The other thing I would say is don't be afraid um, of spending some time after your BPTC doing something a little different. Yeah. You, you might feel pressure at this stage on the BPTC to jump straight into pupillage. I know that I did. When all your friends and contemporaries are applying for pupillage, you might feel a great deal of pressure to go straight into pupillage. Um, I didn't. I, um, I did an internship in an EU institution and I, did a, um, I, did, I spent some time at the Law Commission and those were really happy years and they were really great experiences and once you're in this job you're in it for a long time 
So you can use that time. You've got, I think you've got seven years. I think the Bar Council BSB give you seven years after your PPTC before you before you can do your pupillage. So don't be afraid of that time to do something different to to to, to be able to um, evidence your interest in specific um, areas of law in that in that way. There are a number of things you can do. You can go to the Law Commission to be a research assistant. You can be a judicial assistant in the Court of Appeal. Um, I think the High Court has also extended the judicial assistant um, programme recently, although that might be for um, junior practitioners, but certainly that's something that you could look into. You could you could paralegal, you could um, teach, you could you could do an, in, uh, an internship in, a, in, a, in an international um, organisation. And I think that Grey's Inn have a number of scholarships um, available um, for anyone who's interested in doing an, um, an international um, internship. So do explore all of those um, options. They're all available to you. You don't have to rush straight into pupillage if you do want to take some time to um, do something different. I definitely Thank endorse you. that. That's very sound advice, Tom. Thank you very much. Tom and, and to everybody. I, I believe, I, I, I think Tony might have appeared because it is time to, I think, getting time to, to wrap up. No, not, not at all. I mean, you can go on as long as you want, Harry. I know I, 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 um, I jumped in because there was mention of the education department in Grey's Inn. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just going to say that many people on the, on the webinar are probably scheduled for the pupillage application advice session that we're, we're running um, shortly. If you're not, and it may be too late to get into that session, then please drop me an email. Um, and and uh, exactly as Tom described, you know, we will do our very best to, to get something in front of someone that, that can help. Um, and the other point that Tom raised was about internship awards, which we do offer. So um, please go to the website if you are interested in doing something different. It has to enhance your CV um, and prepare, prepare you for, for that all important pupillage application. But please visit the website and see the information on internship awards. Sorry, that's all. I just say before we wrap up that um, last week, I, in, in my capacity as a bencher at Gray's Inn, I attended virtual call night, um, which was an unusual experience, but a very worthwhile experience. And we were sent the, the list, as, as you normally are given when you, when you go to call night, of those who are being called and where they come from and you know, where, where they've studied and what their future plans were. And I looked at the future plans with a degree of trepidation, anticipating that there would be quite a number who still didn't have their future, their, their next move sorted. And I was enormously relieved and really pleased to see that the vast majority of them were sorted. They, you know, they either had pupillages lined up or they were, um, in, in, in some other cases, actually people from overseas who were returning to their countries as planned to continue their, their, their qualifications there and already had something lined up there. So when we had our little breakout rooms to, for, the virtual, for the virtual cocktail party and drinks afterwards, um, each person I spoke to had a really good plan and, and was well placed and that actually was a striking contrast to other call nights that I have attended where it's been very difficult sometimes because so many people haven't. So I think that was a very, that was a very positive occasion and I really hope that all of you in the fullness of time um, have similar positive outcomes. Yeah, I think Thank just you. to just to finish up on that, my last two pence is that, you know, it's a great career. Mm. It's an absolutely wonderful um, career with highs and lows. But the, the point is, is if you work hard enough and you want it bad enough, then you will get there. It is, it is definitely not an impossible profession at all. Lots and lots of my friends didn't get it first year, second year, third year. There are people in my chambers who applied for, you know, eight or nine years. But when they get there, I think it's all it's all worth it in the end so just keep keep going you might think that you know this isn't the profession for you given you know maybe your academic achievements aren't what you would want them to be but th that can be covered up by just you know sheer hard work and and you know a really good attitude and i'm sure you'll get to where you need to get to thank you i think it's only fair tom that you have uh, your last words as well i think uh, in this in this case and any advice or or uh, encouragement that you can give to 
to uh, people going through the process at the moment. Just to follow on what Jane said, I remember when I was doing my BPTC, I was uh, I, I attended a moot workshop which was judged by um, Aleri Rees, who was the former recorder of Cardiff. And I spoke to Aleri after the moot and she was just wonderful to speak to, really inspiring and um, really encouraging of younger members of, of the inn coming through. And from that, I um, marshalled her for a week in, in Merthyr Tidville Crown Court, which was brilliant. And then in, in all of my um, pupillage applications, I spoke about that what I'd seen in, in that week with Aleri Rees. And I spoke about a cross-examination that I saw that was particularly impressive. I mentioned a bad character application that I'd seen, which was made sort of off the hoof and was really very good and powerful and persuasive. And I, and I, and I was asked about that week in, in, um, in most of my pupillage applications. So I would say, I would agree with Jane, attend the inn's events because you never know who you're going to meet and you never know what opportunity might be afforded um, in attending one of these MOOC workshops or, um, or whatever it might be. Um, and I was, again, I was asked about that experience in most of my um, pupillage interviews. So I would definitely endorse what, um, what, what Jane said about attending as many um, in events as you possibly can.